The Democratic Republic of Congo, the uh, second largest country in Africa, has been mired in conflict for decades. The country has been fraught with political instability, armed clashes and human rights violations, particularly to the east of the country. Bordered by nine countries, the instability is often uh, split into neighboring states. Um, as protagonists have changed over time, the story of conflict remains one with uh, uh, looks like a cycle of brutal violence seemingly far from sight. Congolese journalist Hubert Kabasu uh, uh, Katulondi has uh, written a book, uh, U.S. Marines in the Congo Beni War, which is written as a fiction but is based on true events. And he spoke to me about what the book tells us about the situation in the DRC and perhaps what a final solution might be for the country. Ube, Kabasu, Babu, Katulondi, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ndoro, and uh, warmest greetings to your viewers. So you've written this book, um, fascinating read, uh, U.S. Marines, Congo, Beni, War. It's based on facts. I believe it, it's fiction, but it's based on true events. Yeah, it's a, it's a fictionalization of real tragic events pertaining to the imbroglio of the war in which the militaries and the politicians and the foreign, I mean, neighboring countries, uh, militaries are also involved. Yes, uh, it's based on uh, the U.S. Marines who came to train the Congolese uh, Special Forces. And one of the uh, commanders who was trained uh, is our military hero. Mamadou Ndala. Actually, the book is dedicated to Colonel Mamadou Ndala, but it also relates to the smuggling of gold and agricultural products such as coffee uh, through uh, Rwanda and Uganda. So what are you trying to tell us through this book? Uh, I'm just trying to say that there are two uh, or three fundamental aspects to uh, the situation of war and um, uh, political crisis uh, going on in Eastern Congo. The first one is the weakness of the post-colonial state, uh, particularly in the, in the provinces and rural areas such as Beni and Mutwanga. So uh, one of the major causes of these uh, wars that we are witnessing, observing right now, or deploring right now, relates to the weakness of the state. The Congolese need to build a strong state that can build an infrastructure, school and hospital, etc., etc., uh, to uh, strengthen the legitimacy of the people vis-a-vis -vis the state. But the second uh, dimension is the dimension of the involvement of the Congolese military and uh, some business folks into these uh, uh, illegal uh, dealings, transactions, over strategic uh, uh, minerals uh, such as uh, coltan. Many people know coltan, but they don't know wolfram, uh, wolfram it. They don't know pyrochlor. These are major strategic uh, minerals. Uh, and then the third one is also the what I call inter-African imperialism by Ugandans and Rwandans, Burundians, who are uh, plundering the Congo. And of, of course, the official military officers and politicians will always deny that, but we know for a fact and many uh, institutions, many scholars, many experts, be it of the uh, Congo Study Group, be it of the Human uh, Rights Watch of International Crisis Group, have established facts tangibly. And even Uganda had been uh, compelled by an international court of justice to pay Congo 10 billion US dollars for the devastation that, that were perpetrated in the Congo by Ugandans. We'll unpack a, a lot of what you've said, but uh, perhaps we should go back in time a little bit and uh, unpack some of the history. And I just wonder if uh, the story of present-day DRC, does it have its roots as far back as the First Congo War, 1996, after uh, the Rwandan genocide that destabilized the eastern part of the country? Or do we even have to go back as far as the Congo crisis of 1960 to 65 to get to where, where we are now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You, your, your question uh, is so pertinent uh, because you have a residual element like uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, military because uh, uh, from 1960 to 1965, uh, we had lots of rebellions and, you, uh, and cessations of Katanga, of uh, the uh, the uh, Popular Republic of Congo, which was in Kisangani, 
Ghani. And we even had uh, the legendary uh, world revolutionary Che Guevara who came into the Congo. So in the mountains of Fizi, Baraka, in these all these rural areas of the East, there were still some residual element and even mentality of Simba militias. So which uh, uh, the mentality has carried on and with this element of tradition. And then uh, you, as you pointed out, the war 1996 uh, to 2003, which was uh, uh, portrayed as being uh, the African World, world War, um, after the Sun City dialogue and the agreement, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the militarization. So the number of militias uh, was really reduced. There were like maybe 10 or, or maybe five militia, militia groups like the Simbas, uh, my, my Yakutumba, uh, um, Tomboki, um, Tomboki, something like that in the East. But um, then you had the ADF that started in the 90s in Uganda, and then uh, they were defeated and came to the Congo. So they actually came to bring, although we had our own problems with uh, the uh, residual militias uh, stemming from the war in 1996-2003, the ADF has, uh, came to amplify, to uh, uh, get uh, the situation to the point of where it is complex with the element of terrorism. You see, so as the book uh, indicates there, there's also that dimension of terrorism where the ADF are engaging in, uh, in the money laundering, buying gold, buying coltan, uh, and then uh, supplying also uh, their, their network in Uganda and, and Nairobi. And you find Congolese gold in, uh, in, uh, in Dubai and all these, these places. So yeah, there's that, there's uh, uh, the consequence, consequences of uh, the previous wars but the new elements uh, of the weakness of the state, uh, also the collapse of uh, the parliamentary democracy uh, in, in the Congo, and the inability of African leaders in general, particularly leaders of SADC, to make sure that they stop this inter-African uh, uh, imperialism, where uh, neighboring countries can get into the Congo, plunder as they please, and the, the, the guys will cover of their security of their countries being uh, compromised. You talk about SADC, but it isn't part of the problem that uh, SADC took sides in the Congo war, and that much of what we're seeing now could be as a result of what happened then, the sides that were taken, hence the inactivity now. No, uh, I think to a certain ex extent, well, the involvement of countries like Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, uh, allowed to balance, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the situation of, of uh, different fighting uh, factions. Uh, but at, at, at present, we have a situation where um, I need to emphasize the fact that South Africa, South Africa, which helped the Congo um, find a solution to the war, to the so-called African World War, South Africa played a major role, foundational role, under President Mbeki, that now South Africa has got contingent in the Congo, South Africa and, and the Tanzania have got contingent in the Congo, and uh, more importantly, uh, this needs to be emphasized to the attention of South Africans. South Africa has got three combat helicopters, formidable combat helicopters, which are ranked among the most effective, the Roy Falk combat helicopter, which can be determined in terms of uh, helping the Congolese army defeat this uh, ADF and other militias. And South Africa has got uh, three Oryx transport helicopters. South Africa has got a C-130 uh, big transport uh, aircraft in the Congo. But these arsenal is and the troops uh, are not helping the Congolese to end the war because uh, these uh, arsenal, the helicopters, uh, 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 under the, uh, the, the management of the MONUSCO. MONUSCO is proving to be really not very effective. I am sure that if uh, President Ramposa, as a, as, as a, a chairperson of the organ on politics and uh, security, etc., can play a major role in terms of saying, how do we uh, uh, place these, uh, put uh, these uh, arsenal, these helicopters uh, at the disposal of the Congolese uh, strategic command, so that when they organize the uh, tactical operation, they include air uh, ground attack with the helicopters, that can be decisive. So that's why our organization, Azir New Congo, uh, published an open letter uh, addressed to President Mbeki and President Ramposa to say, hey, 
brother South Africans, you've got three formidable combat helicopters. Why aren't they, these helicopters being used to hand this, this, uh, this, uh, this residual war in the Eastern DRC? Do you believe that um, the insurgencies uh, in the east of uh, the DRC can be solved militarily? You've talked about terror. And the one thing that we started to see is that um, it, it's quite hard in the end to put down terror organizations uh, through the barrel of a gun, that some other processes need to take place either alongside or instead of. Um, well, the, the difference between the terrorist or the so-called terrorist in Eastern DRC, for example, compared to Al Shabaab or or uh, um, uh, other Boko Haram, for example, is that Congo is 99% a Christian country, and these uh, so-called uh, Isla Islamists in East they are what I can conceptualize as a opportunistic terrorist Islamist. Uh, they, are, they don't have, they are not uh, rooted really in Eastern Congo. So uh, they, they are not even uh, widespread in the population. So militarily, this war, if the South African arsenal, I mean, we're talking about Roy Falk uh, attack helicopters. You know, they are, they've got high technology missiles and uh, uh, grenade launcher, et cetera, et cetera. If they are used, Congo has got like 1,000, uh, 150,000. Uh, troops, combined with uh, the, the the Tanzanians, the Kenyans, the South Africans, uh, and you must we must uh, uh, also uh, uh, recall that in 2012 or 2000, 2012, the uh, Force uh, Intervention Brigade, the FIB, defeated the M23, which were more or better organized, uh, better organized military organization than this ADF. So as as I firmly believe that uh, tactically. The Congolese army with South Africans, Tanzanians, and Kenyans can defeat these militias and the uh, ADF because they have what it takes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as far as the Congolese army is concerned, unfortunately, the state of siege didn't, uh, it was not pro well prepared and it wasn't provided with uh, adequate, sufficient financial support. That was revealed by the Minister of Defense, uh, Mr. Kabanda, unfortunately. And as a result, it hasn't been able to achieve much so far. No, no. Uh, the Kivu uh, Security Tracker, which is uh, financed, I think, by Bridgeway Foundation and, uh, and uh, International Crisis Group, they have indicated that so far there are more like, uh, it, 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 we have more than 1,000 uh, people who have been killed since the state of siege has been uh, implemented. Uh, military soldiers, sometimes they go, uh, you know, on, without food and, uh, uh, you know, uh, without proper financial uh, uh, backup. So it's, it's a very, uh, very tricky situation. However, that could have been compensated by the, by the presence of the South African troops contingent, the Kenyans and the Tanzanians with uh, the, uh, uh, the combat helicopter, the transport uh, helicopter. These ADF, they are not like Boko Haram. Boko Haram has got missiles. Uh, Boko Haram has got armored vehicles. These people don't even have armored vehicles. They don't even have missiles. They, it, it does, it's, a, it's a poor man, African, grotesque uh, sort of a bunch with uh, small Kalashnikovs. But they, they don't have like a, a political uh, motive, narrative. They don't say, oh, we need democracy and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, uh, most Congolese believe that these ADF are there just as a cover-up for uh, the predation of uh, Congolese minerals. What role do you think the Ugandan army can play in the peace process in the, uh, at the RC? No, uh, I, will so I will sound very, uh, uh, very radical, but uh, as a Congolese uh, patriot, but I do not believe that the Ugandans can play um, a, a constructive role. Uganda, let's be frank, uh, we've got friends in Uganda. We don't have anything, you know, uh, personal against Ugandans. But Ugandans, first of all, we have to underline the fact that Uganda is experiencing a major economic downturn, where Uganda has got like uh, 15 billion U.S. dollars of external debt. Uganda owes money to the Chinese, who are threatening to seize in Tebe. And uh, Ugandans are looking for ways, you know, uh, avenues to uh, have additional resources. So they will go there 
And they, they've actually said uh, rather cynically that they will stay there as long as uh, the ADF are, are, are there. So they, they, they are there uh, to uh, intensify or increase uh, export of illegal minerals and ir illegal uh, agricultural products. Uh, let me tell you that as we're talking right now, Ugandans have got a ref gold refinery in Entebbe, uh, uh, an investment of 15 billion US dollars, that re refined 70% uh, of its uh, gold. It is, it's illegal gold from the Congo. You see, so there is no need, there is no need, militarily speaking, strategically or tactically, operationally, for Ugandans to be there. You have just to improve uh, the, 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 the asset that is in the Congo already, talking about the South African contingent, the Tanzanian, and the Kenyan. And uh, SADC uh, um, uh, uh, leaders have to insist so that uh, the, the UN and MONUSCO remodel its, its actions there. Because for them, to get these um, South African uh, uh, combat helicopter idols sitting there doing nothing, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, uh, you see. So Ugandan's contribution, I don't see any uh, positive uh, contribution that Ugandans can bring right now. They are there, as most Congolese perceive it, uh, and, and that perception is based on previous experiences where, for example, in 1999 and 2000, the Ugandans fought the Rwandans in uh, the city of Kisangani, for diamond and gold. They destroyed the city of Kisangani. And uh, I think in 2005, also, they fought again in Ituri. So uh, the Ugandans have no contribution, really, that can be intelligently articulated. Perhaps finally, um, what, what do you think needs to happen to bring a lasting solution uh, to the DRC? One gets a sense that uh, a lot of what's going on is more gangsters playing <laughs> and being soldiers and that it's about looting and uh, anything but other than genuine causes uh, that people can look at and recognize as something that needs to be dealt with. What do you think needs to happen and what role can the international community play? Uh, you, 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 you say it so uh, pertinently uh, because, I mean, the ADF do not have I was involved in, in the rebellion uh, with the RCD and so on and so forth. They recruited me from South Africa when I used to appear on Morning Live at the mm -hmm. time of uh, where brother William Bully and others. Um, uh, so uh, the point really is uh, that the wars, that, like in 2000, 1996, 1997, or 1988, had a political cause, no democracy, no viable constitution, no institutions. The ADF do not have, they are just an opportunistic uh, group of Islamists. And you have the, the, the hordes of, uh, of these uh, uh, Kodeko and others, uh, Simba militias and Rayam Tomboki and uh, others. They don't have a political cause. So the uh, solution would be, first of all, internally. As you said earlier on, Mr. Tshisekedi's regime uh, is, uh, is experiencing a crisis of legitimacy because Mr. Tshisekedi, uh, uh, as, a, as a congressman, uh, 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 Smith Chris of uh, New Jersey, uh, issued a declaration in March saying that the, the Congo is experiencing an authoritarian autocratic drift. So Mr. Tshisekedi violated the Constitution on several occasions. He created a new majority based on bribing uh, uh, members of, of parliament. So he has weakened the democratization momentum, he has weakened the institutional system, which could, uh, if there was like a, a minimal um, uh, cohesion, national cohesion, that framework could help talk to various partners. So there's that, first of all, the vul political vulnerability must be addressed. In that regard, Mr. Chisekedi is supposed to convene some kind of a, a dialogue, not to share power, some kind of a dialogue with uh, uh, stakeholders, ma ma major politicians, to say, how do we remodel our political systems, system based on the experience of uh, uh, Joseph Kabila's regime and the contradictions of this regime, and also some good things, uh, that uh, some accomplishment uh, of Mr. Shisekedi, like combating corruption and uh, 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 making the, the, the law prevail. So that's internally. But uh, internally also, it is of absolute and dispensable uh, importance for Mr. Chisekedi to uh, allocate sufficient financial backup to the Congolese army. The key pillar uh, in solving this problem is the Congolese army. 
uh, uh, modernize the army, give the ar army uh, an adequate arsenal. I'll give you an example. The Congolese army is, uh, okay, uh, global firepower and Institute of Security Studies, they speak about like 150, 150 to 200,000 uh, men. And the budget is only uh, 300 million US dollars, which is very, very small for a country of that size with nine neighbors. You see, they should have even doubled that. But compared to, for example, Mr. Chisekedi's uh, gigantic presidency, where he has got 1,090 uh, advisors and, and 10,000 staff, and that presidency alone consumes something like 250 million US dollars of Congolese budget. It does make sense. So you have, for example, to re remodel the institutions, reduce uh, the, 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 the size of, of the presidency, reduce uh, the expenses of other institutions, and uh, uh, allocate more money to the army and to, to, to the social reconstruction, infrastructural re reconstruction, so that when you are undertaking, uh, when you have a strong army, at the same time, you are rebuilding Eastern Congo, you see. But then thirdly, I think SADC, I insist, uh, President uh, Lazarus Chakwera, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera of Malawi, who's uh, the current chair chairperson of SADC, and President uh, Ramposa, who's the chairperson of the organ on politics and security, they have to stand up. Because if there's a full-blown war in the DRC, it will have consequences, repercussions in SADC in terms of business and refugees flocking here. So it's high time they stood up and uh, for them to be proactive in uh, attempting uh, uh, at the same time to get the Congolese to solve the problem internally, politically, but also to get the, the people in the region, like, uh, President Museveni, President Kagame, to stop their regional uh, predation, the original inter-African uh, imperialism. Hubert, I wish we could talk for longer, but, uh, you know, the DRC is a complex, complex story. But thank you so much uh, for giving us a reflection, uh, especially uh, through this book of yours that uh, perhaps might give people a little bit of insight as to what's happening on the ground there. But thank you so, so much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Nduro, and thank you to the viewers.